Welcome to this week's Two Guys and Some Horror. In this week's installment, Clarks wants you to kill the word that's killing you. And I'm trying to avoid being turned into goblin food, because we watched Pawnee Pool and Troll 2. Which one's bad? Which one's good? You help us decide. Alright, so that's the first time we've ever tried that, and I hope it wasn't absolute shit. Um, but yeah, let's get into Pawnee Pool from 2008. I've seen somewhere it says 2009 as well. So it was definitely 2008 here. Uh, it looks like in Turkey it was released in 2009. So that's probably the weirdness I'm seeing. Maybe. Um, I, it was also an individual or an indie film. So you, you have to think about when it was released in, for limited release and then when it was released for actual person consumption or whatever. Gotcha. Cool. So quick synopsis on it. Washed up DJ finds himself in a crazy situation and only his voice can save the world. Anything you want to add to that? I mean, it's a, it's a zombie movie, but uh, you only see... One? You see, like... No, you see a couple. You see about... You see a handful of zombies. But it's not your standard zombie film. It's, uh, it's completely different because the way you become a zombie has never been done before in any other film. That is true. Um, I feel like this movie definitely, uh, like you talked about before, like it has, it has some underlying meanings, right? It's got some, um, I'm not really sure how to describe it. Um, some different takes on how human beings can be affected by different things. So in this telling of how the infection spreads or whatnot, it's, it's your words, right? It's what you say. <clears throat> and it's not just the words, it's you trying to make connections between the words and other types of logic. And once you try to do that, the virus seems to overtake you. It's more of a meaning-based thing than the words themselves. Right. And I, I mean, I just want to start by saying, like, I absolutely love this movie. Um, I didn't even know what to... I only watched the trailer after you talked about it. So these are... these Both these movies we're going to be discussing today uh, were Clark's picks, Um and like we do every week, we, we pick one kind of critically acclaimed uh, good horror film, and we pick one critically acclaimed bad horror film, but people still talk about, right? Because it's usually really funny. Um, Potty Pool, I had never seen. I had never heard of it. I didn't even know anything really about it. I watched the trailer and still was left kind of like, okay, maybe it's zombies. I don't know, because uh, the trailer doesn't give a whole lot away there. Um, but... This movie has an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, some more info on it. It's a 90-minute runtime. And scrolling through the actors and actresses inside of it, there's really nobody big, nobody famous. Uh, so the indie film uh, definitely, like, it, this is exactly what it is. Um, and I have to say, like, once again, I absolutely love this film. I thought it was a great, uh, great movie. Great movie. Great choice. Absolutely, Oprah. Absolutely. And let me just say, no, uh, sorry about the uh, background noise. My roommate's uh, blending some stuff. But uh, I'm going to have to fully agree with you there. The first time I saw this, I think it was like 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was on Netflix at that time, I, I think. But whatever point it was on Netflix, I was just kind of going through movies and was like, oh, this this looks interesting. And I watched it and I was like, holy, holy crap. This is this is amazing. Um. So one of the things that, that they do differently is that your words are essentially used as a relay, and it's how the uh, the zombies or the creatures, whatever they are, sick people, uh, infected, whatever, it's how they find you. They, they're kind of like vocal relays. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's one point where one of the infected, like they'll they'll repeat whatever words they hear, and they'll say it over and over again. But at one point, one of the affected can't re, uh, trans, transmit the, the virus or, or, or give it away or, or whatever, infect anyone else. And she just explodes or she just vomits and then dies. Right, because she's outside the booth. And so it's a, it's a 
uh, let's let's lay out the scene a little bit there. So there, it's a disc jockey, right? So he's a radio show host. Um, uh, you meet him right off the bat in the beginning of the film. He's driving to work. Um, and this crazy lady, while he stopped waiting for this train to pass, this crazy, crazy lady comes out of nowhere up to his car window. Um, and he's like, hey, hey, who are you? Who are you? That's my first note. <laughs> That's the first note because I'm like, holy crap. Okay. Already right off the bat, you're trying to um, use a jump scare. And I was a little bit worried because I'm like, this can get really old really fast. But I have to tell you, like, that doesn't happen uh, like that for the rest of the movie. That's probably the worst scene you're going to see in the film. I wouldn't even call that a jump scare, scare really. That was just kind of, it's like he sees this woman and he's like, he's confused. And she says something and then she just walks away. And you can't really make out what she's saying. I, I tried to give you like give some kind of understanding about it, and I really couldn't figure out what she was saying. She was definitely like gibberish. You know what I mean, like mumbling. Right. Uh, and the, before that, even then, and I want to I want to touch back on this later. You're talking about the but... opening. Yes. Talking? So this, yeah, this yeah. actually. Yeah, so this actually connects to the ending. Like the very beginning, you hear the word he's he's trying to talk about Pawnee Pool, and he's talking he's making like absurd connections to the word pony pool he's talking about panties he's talking about pools he's talking about blood pools bloody panties pony pool panty pool and it's a uh, it's just this kind of gibberish that's kind of interconnected and there's no real sense in the connections but it's kind of like how your brain kind of matches things that aren't really matching yeah how it like naturally will put two things together that don't necessarily go together but it works right 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 so that's a that's that's a pretty big uh that's it was actually really brilliant how they did that at the very beginning because if you rewatch the movie after seeing it the first time you're like oh wow that makes sense yep uh, it's one of those things that makes the wor- the movie worth watching at least twice i watched first this time. movie's intro four times trying to figure out what significance that would have without watching the whole movie right i just kept watching right. i watched that probably like four times just trying to figure out what it what I had to do, and it didn't do anything for me until the end. Right, it right. Was, it was amazing. It was cool. Right. And uh, sorry for kind of jumping the gun with the the vomit scene, but no, you're good. <laughs> uh, there's there's a scientist character in the movie that that kind of, which we could discuss a little bit more. He, he's just kind of observing her, and he's going, "Oh, so that's what happens." And it kind of just like this, <laughs> kind of gives us the viewer. Uh, a sense of scientists kind of investigating, Hey, what, what is going on here? What is causing this? Oh, that's interesting. I, uh, yeah. So after, so we have that, uh, driving scene to get to work. He's working. He, uh, talks to the young lady, the young gal who's, um, his kind of not really his assistant, but kind of his assistant It's Laurel Ann, I think. Um, Right, because Sydney's the 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 I don't even know what you'd call it, the show's producer, is Sydney? Yeah, and then Laurel the Ann. Okay, and then Laurel Ann's the young gal who uh, basically is like his assistant, who's taking calls, funneling in information in, and then uh, Sydney, the producer, her job is to make sure he stays on track, doesn't talk off key, uh, doesn't talk about things he's not supposed to, which he does instantly. So you can tell he's got some some problems in his life, whatever. Uh, he got yep. fired from his last job, it sounds like, and yep. this is the only, you know, disc jockey job he can get. Because he went off the rails yep. at some point. Yep. And then they have this really, really fun, uh, witty banter between the two of them. Uh, and my note is just, ban- uh, witty banter, I love it. Like, it was really, I thought it was fun. I thought it gives us a really good insight into uh, Grant's character, uh, Grant Massey, uh, right. and, and really gets you inside what drives him because he's he's totally like against the government uh he's like the government's out to get you kind of a guy right he just makes a bunch of crap up like he just on the radio he's like there might be it might be the government it might be some alcoholic police officers and it's just kind of like he pulls some things out of his ass and he's it, it kind of sounds like he's a conspiracy theorist yes <laughs> yes in terms of like how he works tinfoil uh, hat the martians are coming <laughs> Liquor in his coffee. He's, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I, I, how did I forget that? He's a very – and he's talking to his agent the first time, and he fires his agent. Yep, on and the way to work. <laughs> and at one point, there's uh, 
Okay, so like something happens after his conspiracy theory, like during his conspiracy theory bullshit too. Like there's there are people being held inside like an ice fishing shed or something like that. Yes. So this and is the he, first moment we get kind of a glimpse at what the hell is going on, right? Right. And like the uh, I don't I'm, I don't recall exactly what happens. It's not. It, that's kind of where he kind of goes off on a, and he talks about how the police officers are alcoholics and like his producer, she kind of cuts him off. He's like, you know what? This is my brother-in-law. He, you know, he is an alcoholic. How, what the fuck's wrong with you? Right. And the kind of, she goes out, on to hey, like have this conversation with Grant though. Like they know each other for a long time. And then all of a sudden she's like, I just hired you. <laughs> like, you can't be saying these things. I just hired you. But they, they the way they talked. Yeah. Very, very weird. Uh, they have there. good chemistry, uh, like very good chemistry between two actors, like as good as you yeah. can get. So they they may have just hired him, but they may have worked with each other before. Like you could definitely glean that. Like, hey, I, I went out on a limb to get you this job. Please don't. Don't mess like, this it, up. Yeah. It may be there. That's just speculation. But like, it, and this, this lady, she's a... Uh, She's got problems with like she's obviously gone through a divorce mm-hmm. and doesn't like, get to her, see her kid. Yeah, her ex husband has the kids for the weekend and she can't really get a hold of them. And it's you gotta get a little bit of personal connection between her, Mr. Mazzy, and also <clears throat> Sydney very little. Like she uh she came back from the Canadian military, some sort of thing. So she's Wait, you mean Laurel Ann? Uh Laurel Ann, yeah. So yeah. she's the one that understands the uh the police messages are like oh it's uh it's some random code thing i'm like oh that's a hostage situation so right yeah yeah so we get to meet uh gourd and ken so ken is the helicopter guy right yep uh who's actually Sunshine just Sunshine ken who's yeah. actually just in his truck driving around the hilltops of the city uh reporting in on stuff gourd is a caller uh he calls in to report some information as well. I swear to God, those two guys are the same exact person. They sound uh, like the same exact person. So uh, I can't, I don't see anything in IMDb that gives me confirmation in that. But uh, yeah, I don't get any, no confirmation on that. We do know that Ken is Rick Roberts. That is the actor. But Gord does not show up anywhere in here as a character. This is a very small cast. I'd like to... Throw that out there as well. At least 30 people. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 total cast members. 18 if you account Fish Hut Man, who is uncredited. Um, Was this including the the, the random zombies who come inside the uh, building near um, the end? We get Spooky Woman. Um, Spooky Woman. That's the lady who shows up at the very beginning. We get, yeah, we get Colleen, Maureen, Jay, Tony. Right. Nancy, I think that counts them. That's them, right? Uh, I th- those are probably because they're not main characters in the in the booth. We know that. Right. Doctor Mendez is here. Laurel Land. Oh man, the doctor. He was such a. What the hell was that guy doing? Uh, okay, so just to skip, ha- just to help us move this one forward a little bit, um, I'll just give you some of my notes. You can stop me or rewind me as you need to. Yeah, we don't have to go over the whole movie either. We can no, just... yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so I found it very interesting. The character development was great. Uh, you know, like Grant is giving this long kind of soliloquy about how long the winter is, and that's really what drives him in his depression. Um, so you really get that bonding with Mazzy, and uh, you really feel for him. You start to actually feel bad, even though he seems like a total a-hole at first. Well, he's uh, definitely a dick. Yeah, definitely. He treats Ken like shit. He treats, uh, he's very uh, antagonistic, except for towards uh, Laurel Ann. Yeah. She's and then, like the only one he kind of treats pretty kindly. No, he loves Laurel Ann. He thinks she's great, uh, right? Because she gets him the booze. That's why. There's no other reason. <laughs> but so he has that, so he has that moment uh, with, with Sydney where he explains to her his depression and how the winters and how long they are really take effect on him mentally and at that moment i start to kind of feel for him um you know living where we live uh it's sunny all the time if it was dark all the time i don't know how i would do mentally 
um, I think anyone could probably, uh, you know, kind of feel that that compassion there for him. Um, kind of go ahead. Yeah, throughout the film, you kind of get the sense that he's he wants he, he he's kind of a, we need to get the truth out to the people type type of guy, even if it's at the risk of his own job, which it looks like in the past that has happened. Because he really he really wants to focus on this breaking news story. And instead of focusing on that, this lady's like, all right, now you're going to listen to a bunch of random people in blackface pretend to be like they're from Saudi Arabia or uh, not Saudi Arabia, wherever Osama bin Laden was, uh, Pakistan or wherever. And they're like singing about like murdering people and shit. And it's bad. And his agent calls him. He's like, this is what you did to me. He's like holding it up. And he says, F you. And then he closes the phone. Yeah. It's like, uh uh-uh. uh. Like, guy's a, guy's a complete tool. Uh, but at the same time, you could tell he, there's something he cares about. And it's getting the truth or getting the information out to the people. I mean, I feel like he's just trying to break a big story, too. Because you're right. Like, he kept trying to drive home that one story, you know, like, uh, we have a report of hundreds of people, you know, piling into this building looking for this guy who did these horrible things or whatever. And like, he doesn't really have any facts. He only has what Ken reported in visually. Um, right. And they don't really have anything, I, I would say, hard evidence that anything bad was really going on. Um, but in fact, that was probably the beginning of the end, you could say, for for some of these people, right? Because that was the moment uh, when we start to pick up as a viewer, something zombie-like is going on right now. Um, right. And if you if you come yeah. into this movie thinking like it's a zombie movie, you're like, oh, so, you know, this this is where, where the outbreak's happening. So we're in a radio station. We're not seeing any zombies. and But we're hearing about people just kind of exploding out of this building. Like the building's just like full of people and they're running and eating people's faces. And you hear Ken com- like call in, complain about it. He's like, oh, crap, I got to go. Hangs up the phone. Like just – from a viewer's perspective, it's just absolutely terrifying. Yeah. At that moment, um, cause Ken has some stuff happen to him. I mean, literally my next note is Ken is fucked. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, uh Oh, he's, he's a goner. Um, then we hear some random baby crying, uh, when they, when they start to try and, you know, figure some stuff out, Ken trips or Grant trips balls, um, starts to think everyone's kind of out to get him freaks the F out. Then he wants to get back on the mic. Then all of a sudden he's totally fine. He's sobered up. And he's like, let's start telling regular news. <laughs> well, the, the BBC calls in and like they don't know what's going on. They no, but they railroad news. him. The BBC yeah. guy totally railroads him. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they didn't know what was going on. He's like, this guy doesn't have any information, so we're going to move on. Yeah, they don't even know he's what's like, going you... on in their own city. That's basically right. what they try to do, Right. Right. And you hear, uh, so essentially, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Canada, uh, Pontypool is, I, I would assume, close to Quebecois or Quebec, Quebec. Uh, so the, the, there are French Canadians in this film and mm-hmm. there's like, they, they swap between fr- French and English. So that, that's important to note because at one point, like they get cut off on the air, like they just get completely cut off. And it's just uh, like, as soon as the, the guy Ken is about to say something, they cut him off, and you just hear a bunch of like French Canadian words. I don't even know what they're saying. Yeah, I don't remember subtitles either at that moment. Um, so they're definitely trying to put that seclusion feeling. It, it, I mean, it's a it's really well done um, because one of the big factors, you know, is the English language is part of the problem, right? Right. What what we're saying uh, in the English language is is triggering these events and, and causing more infectious behavior. So when they cut to a different language and seclude you from what they're saying, and if you don't understand French, uh, like I, I don't, I took one year of French, so don't even try to quiz me. Um, I don't know any. Yeah, so, so you definitely feel secluded. Like you're not meant to know what's happening for a reason. Um, and like, to backtrack yeah. a little bit, the doctor appears some point around this time. He sneaks in through a window and he explains pretty much. He's like, uh, he essentially gives us what's turning people into these these zombies. Like, yeah, he breaks it down. Yep. Laurel Ann 
you know, she unfortunately, she is our our sacrificial lamb in the film, and we see her uh, just kind of. She's like, he's like, oh, we need to close the door. She doesn't know yet, but she's she's one of them. She's hunting us, and he yeah, closes she, the door on her and sound for She room. started, you know, speaking in gibberish, repeating the same word, kind of a thing. And then, right. so they all huddle into that sound booth. So this brings us back to where you were at a couple minutes ago, um, where we we're talking well, about how she starts she starts freaking out. Right? We get to see the yeah. first glimpse of what this thing is really doing to people. So. Really, uh, to understand what what's turning people into these zombies or creatures, it is like going back to the the connections, the words. It's it, they don't know how it's being carried, but it's these words. And before Laurel Ann actually starts going insane, she like says something, and she's like she's like Mr. Mazzy is where where's the cat, Mr. Mazzy, and she at that point she she's gone, and she's just kind of. A zombie and so the doctor explains hey words somehow have an effect and it's changing people into like these relays or like kind of like radio stations or like signals where they will repeat things over and over again and if they hear something they'll relay it and it'll reach to another one and they'll relay it so kind of like your words become a signal and if your words can't reach them verbally uh or auditorial auditorially through speakers uh and they don't affect anyone then they vomit blood and die. Yep, which leads us to the next big piece, uh, the puke warning, I'd say. It's around 67 minutes into the film. So Laura Land unfortunately does this. She gets to that point where she is unable to hear anyone and figure out what's really going on. Uh, Laura Land is losing it, and then she does. She has that big, uh, empties her body uh, out. It was, I mean, that's... That's probably the most gruesome thing that we actually see in this film. Um, so if you're worried about gore or anything like that, don't be. Um, if you can handle that, you're good. But then Dr. John gets like an erection over this. Like he gets super excited. He's like, you know, from a doctor's perspective, you can tell he's really examining the cause and effect of what's happening with her. And he's studying her and he's using this as a big uh, learning moment. Right. I mean, like, he goes nuts over this. Like he gets really excited. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he is observing it as a scientist. And then he loses it, um, a little bit about five minutes later because Mazzy and Sydney have to actually go out of the room, uh, and leave him in there, uh, because he started to actually sound like he was losing it. Right. Uh, a little bit there. Yeah. I don't know, but I don't know if, so, and, and I mean, we try not to spoil too much. Uh, obviously, we like to dissect the movie a lot. There's a lot to talk about with this movie. Um, but here's where I, I have a little bit of trouble with the doctor because the last few notes that I actually have um, are, you know, the doctor loses it. Um, then, so Mazzy and Sydney uh, kind of move away into the side where, basically where the doctor came in through the window. It's like a side room. Um, away from Laura Land's crazy ass body, um, they go over there, and there's the two doors right where all the people are outside, and a little girl, um, who was from the the play. Oh yeah, we didn't even talk about the weird Lawrence of Arabia play that came in that Mazzy had to do. Oh man, that was so unbearable. Like I can, I kind of cringed because like that play was bad. Um, Basically, there's there's a city play. They're there. They're they're filming Lawrence of Arabia, um, and he has to suffer through them singing a song, and the song is very, very uh, edgy. It's it's not good. Um, but anyways, this little girl's still there later on in the film, and she has turned. Uh, this is this is the second person you really see who is infected or whatever, and basically they have to kill her. But it's completely off screen, um, so you don't really actually see anyone get killed. You just kind of hear it and understand that it happened. Um, and then the doctor comes back. <laughs> and doesn't he bail out the window or whatever to go save them? Like, running down the not, street? Not to save them, he leaves. He wants to get out of there. So 
Uh, he, he made sorry, his yeah. escape at this point. And that's where he he is gone from the film, and we don't know what happened to him. But he he understands enough to what's happening, so he he can just speak French because he's Quebecois, so he doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, but yeah, so when everybody's kind of coming in and zombifying, like they lose access to the uh, recording room, and uh, they're stuck in a closet. Yep. So they're stuck in this room. Uh, they do. I mean, they have a window in, window out kind of a situation. The doctor uh, proved that. Um, and and yeah, like we're not gonna. I I don't think we need to talk about the end. I think uh, no. the end is actually superb. It's very well done. Um, I know you have a note on the end of the movie though that you want to tie back into the beginning. Right. Um, but I'll let. Uh, I'll just. I'll end my notes with. Uh, kill the word that's killing you like probably the best line uh in the film and really drove it home uh for me right and helped me understand what what the hell was going on there at the end so uh let's hear let's hear your last note tie that baby together right so i will the the part where they find a way to kind of overcome like kisses kill kisses kill kisses kill um I believe that's uh, that's one of the most important phrases in the movie because they change. At some point, they change the meaning of words, but at the very end, after the credits, there's a scene that's completely the opposite from the very beginning. The very beginning, there's this, there are sound bites where the man's or Mazzy's making connections between words that are just kind of seamless, but they make some sort of sense. But it's like, why, why is he even saying this? But at the very end, it starts out black and white. Um, I won't go into detail beyond that, but they just say a bunch of nonsense. None of it makes any sense whatsoever. And it's just, it, if you watch this for the first time, you're like, oh, I don't understand. What, what's, how does this even work compared to the beginning? But it was actually really brilliant because of, instead of like, it's like, okay, so sometimes things just don't make sense. And maybe it's better to not make any connections between them. I think that's very well put. Yeah. I just thought that last scene was absolutely brilliant. And it's kind of, a lot of people say, oh, this was a screen test. But if you actually go back to hear what the director was saying, he was like, yeah, it, it was there before the credits, but a lot of viewers were confused by it. So we put it in afterwards and I'm hoping people will get the meaning behind it. So yeah. Great pick Clark. Uh, very great pick. So uh, I would give it a good solid 8 out of 10. <clears throat> Definitely could have, I mean, for a horror film, could have had more kills maybe. Um, but that kind of also helped with the suspense aspect of it for me. So um, I don't know if I'll ever give a film 10 out of 10 uh, with what we're watching. But I um, thought it was really good. I definitely would watch it again um, here in the next year. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, it's one of the most unique films um, ever made. And I will, I, I've never seen anything like it uh, for a lo, for such a low budget and for what it was. Actually, easily, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to look up the budget while you... Uh, easily in my top 20, easily. Um, but I wouldn't even consider it a horror. I would consider it more of a cerebral kind of, I don't know, it makes, it makes you think. Okay. Like, it's not the kind of film that you watch for the lighting. It's not the kind of movie you watch for the effects. It's not the kind of movie you watch for the action. It's one of those movies that you just kind of watch and you're like, oh, I've never thought about that. That's really interesting. That's a very abstract thought. Okay. So looking at some information um, about it, it says the production budget was $1.5 Domestic release was in, uh, yeah, so it was May 29th of 2009 um, by IFC Films. So that's the disparity there between the 2008 date versus the 2009. It definitely was a 2008 film. It didn't finally get out till 2009 due to it being an independent film. It did take some time to get, get that traction. Probably won a crap ton of awards. Um, let's see, full financials. It doesn't have anything. There are no video sales. Internationally... You know, this movie did not make 
uh, money in the box office. That's just not, that wasn't their intent. Um, it only pulled in worldwide box office, 31,900. Uh, that's $31,900. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I wish this movie would made way more money um, for the actors, the writers, uh, everyone involved. Because, like I said, I mean, and like you've been saying, this is definitely a great, great film. Much, much bigger film than they uh, they got for it being such a uh, small indie film. All right, well, uh, that wraps up Pontypool. Um, unless there's anything else. Master Clack no, would like to say no. Passion, passion projects are usually the best. Yeah. Well, get guess what? Get ready for some terrible shit because we're about to go over Troll Two, and this is the exact opposite feel that I have <laughs> for Potty Pool. Uh, quick synopsis on Troll Two: Family takes vacation to a small town where goblins are eating everyone who goes there. Very easy. Uh, same runtime, so it's ninety minutes. Um, this film is from 1990, and its Rotten Tomatoes score is a whopping 6%. All right, so the first five minutes of this movie is super intense. Grandpa's telling, uh, what's that little boy's name? Crap, I already lost it. Joshua? I think I, yeah, I think that's it. Joshua. Yep. Yep. So Grandpa's telling Joshua about... <laughs> These goblins and this German dude in Lederhosen. I think that's your favorite part because he's not really German, but you think doesn't he doesn't make might any be. fucking sense. <laughs> no, zero sense. No, zero. It's, it's just like this lady with painted on freckles feeds him some fucking toothpaste. Some hot lady with freckles uh, is what they say in the movie. Man, um, she's okay. She's all right. Um, then we find out. Guess what? Grandpa's dead. And by the way, this is probably going to be spoiler ridden. So if you actually want to watch Troll Two and you don't want to be spoiled, get out of here now because we're he's gonna a, we're gonna ruin this thing. <laughs> he's a magical grandpa. Excuse me. Yep, he's a ghost. Um, he's a ghost. And uh, <laughs> nobody, nobody can act. Worst acting I'm sorry, ever, Grandpa. <laughs> I won't interrupt you again. That's right, you little miserable shit. Let me tell you this story about this. Eat British doofus in Lederhosen. Banish him from your mind. Actual quote. I think the father tells the kid that, doesn't he? Banish him from your mind. I don't remember. Dude, your grandpa's dead. Get over it. That's <laughs> hey, dads are good for nothing, Joshua. Oh man. Okay, so we cut from him kind of having that that dream where his grandpa's telling him the story. The parents are telling him to get over his dead grandfather. And then, uh, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit, and there's the sister. She's working out in her room. She's got her own weight yeah. bench. She's <laughs> the in, like... mom kind of comes in. She, like, <laughs> pokes her head, and she's like, oh, you, closes the door. Yep. Yep. She's like that awkward teenager letter B kind of moment. Um, and then Elliot sneaks into her room. Her name's Holly, so the sister is Holly. Elliot, her boyfriend, sneaks into the room. They have like this really weird uh, exchange where she's upset that, you know, he cares more about his friends than her, blah, blah, blah. The dad doesn't approve of him because he's always with his friends. It's like, man, these people in this film really don't want you to hang out with your friends. Either you're in with this family or you're out like grandpa, you know, like you're either in or you're dead. Um, do you remember the homoerotic joke they made? So, uh, Elliot says... Oh, the masturbation joke? No, 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 no. Basically, he says to her, uh, that he takes his friends to bed with him. Like, that was, like, literally the quote. I thought she said that. You take your friends to bed with him, but even then he's like, what, are you trying to make me a homo? Right. She's like... Jerk off in the bathroom. He's like, "You trying to make me gay? I'll make you. My dad will make you gay. I'll cut off your balls and feed them to you." It's like, that makes you gay. Guess what? Then it's too. Well, in the '90s it did, right? I mean, you got to remember a '90s lens. They, they, a lot of people still didn't have their shit figured out in the '90s, uh, especially when it came to stuff like gay, not gay, what makes you gay, all that kind of stuff. Like, we're not going to dive down deep into that, but the '90s was not a great time. Uh, for those kinds of conversations. Um, his two friends show up, though, at, almost at that exact moment. And you actually start to wonder, like, does he spend a little bit too much time with his friends? 
they should have stayed down and not come up into the window to ruin his moment. Um, all right, so then they the family is going for their vacation, right? So they're planning their trip to um, Neilbog. Neilbog is the name of the the town that they're heading to. Uh, and she basically tells the boyfriend that night in the room, like, either you show up to my place at 8 a.m. Without, without your friends your friend. or we're done. And what happens, Clark? Uh, what happens? He doesn't show up for like three hours. Exactly. And parents leave him. Well, <laughs> why didn't you wait five more minutes for him? It's because like 11 it's o'clock. <laughs> he didn't show up. He was late. I got a southern accent and none of y'all other people have accents. Let me just tell you something about I hate your boyfriend. He's a garbage human being. Oh, man. Oh, but I love him. You don't have to like him. I do. The acting in this movie is so bad. So, so bad. Oh, um, no, Joshua. Please, please sing us that song I like so much. Oh, my God, yes. Yeah, so they're in the car trip. And row, 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 row your, your boat, boat gently down the stream. <laughs> oh, my God, no. No. Oh, man. Uh, when she gives the finger, right? When she gives the finger. So dead how grandpa they, shows they up. They didn't even see her. Like, how could they... Like, why? I don't know, but all I thought she in my head was... And she saw him and the friends, and she's like, oh, I'm so mad that he came here without us, and he came with his friends. All I all I remember saying in my head at that moment was, such a pristine finger from such a pristine girl. Gotta get my Breakfast Club reference in here to make me feel better. Um, so they get there, right? They arrive at, at uh, Nilbog, and they're greeted with a really creepy family leaving, um they're swapping keys they're basically doing a house swap for the weekend right oh my god and they're all they're huge they're huge jerks too the, the key swap yeah yeah i, I mean hope I'm... you enjoy your place here at Nilbog. actually their acting right there was on point for uh for for what they are right um some little a little bit of uh creepiness going on there um we got all the major appliances. We got a microwave, a refrigerator, and Joshua was like, "Yeah." Just despite earlier, he's like, "I want to go home." Because grandpa, because dead, grandpa dead told me we gotta go back. Dead, dead grandpa said we gotta leave. No, son, grandpa's not alive. That's what I said. Dead grandpa. <laughs> like, oh man. So then they they have all this food, right? They're starving. They're hungry. They're checking the fridge. Nothing's in the fridge. But then on the table, there's this like lovely lunch sprayed out or uh, spread out over the table for them with it looked like green lemonade and green cake and everything in this movie is green everything everything you eat well, everything some blue drinks too what's up there's some blue and red drinks there's too blue okay i was gonna say I, I i think there are the some of the drinks are the colors but oh my yeah. god like if you know anything about the story grandpa just told you why would you touch any of it? You know that the green shit is bad for you. You know it's not good. What, what I tell doing? you all, this is hospitality. Country hospitality. We are farmers now. Oh, man. So, That's so, essentially what he said. So the kid pisses all over that just so his family doesn't whoa, eat it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before he pisses on it, let's, the grandpa, magical grandpa shows up and he's like, Guess what, guys? I can freeze time now. But it's 10 seconds, and he snaps his finger, and time freezes, and everybody has, like, corn on, the girl has corn on the cob with, like, jizz on, green jizz on it. Yep. The dad has about to eat, like, a burger, and the mom's about to eat something, and the kid gets up on the table, and he's like, I must do it. I must. I must. And he's, like, going towards his crotch. <laughs> <laughs> and he pisses all over the food. And then his dad treats him like a bad dog who just urinated on the carpet and walks him upstairs. When he, like, pulls out his belt, I was like, he's about to hit his kid. Dude, I... PG movie. <laughs> what are you about to do, daddy? I'm tightening my belt for, so I don't feel hunger pains. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> I had flashbacks to when I was a kid, and my dad used to take his belts off. I was like, oh, man, this kid's going to get it, and I know exactly how that feels. And then he didn't even do it. He just says, I'm tightening my belt so I don't feel the hunger pains. And I and what he, then he goes, uh, you bet your mama and your sister are going to do it too. 
because we're not going to feel those pains. It's it's like they don't have a car and they don't know how to get to the store to buy food because they're hungry. So instead, they're just going to starve for the night. Yep. So they don't have anywhere to – they can't get uh, – for some reason, they don't want to go into town, uh, you know, to the store at that moment. So they're just going to starve for the night. Um so then everyone goes to bed, next day comes around, and guess who we run into? Elliot and his two stupid friends. His three stooges. Except Arnold looks like he's thirty five, by the way. None everyone, of these kids look the right. The other age. kids the other kids look like they're in their twenties. But Arnold Arnold's got like the receding hairline. He he does not look he does not look young. Drew, yeah, Drew and Arnold. Um Let's see. Which one goes off first? Uh, That's Arnold. Arnold leaves Arnold, the trailer, yeah. and he's like, "Where are the Where are the new bile women who want to have fun?" And so well, he goes out and he like finds he sees, one. He sees a girl with green on her running, and that's where we meet the goblins. Don't not chase trolls. cute looking girls into the woods. That's my first note. So if you and I go camping, we're not going to chase cute girls going into the woods. That's a stupid idea. Well, you're married, so are you human? Very human. Want to see? <laughs> that's right he does say that and then like there's like a bunch of goblins and they, look, they don't look like goblins they look like people in fat suits and like giant plastic masks hey clark what's the number one problem with this film there are no there's no troll there's no troll <laughs> there's no so troll. This girl man he's like don't worry I'll protect you from these goblins. Yep. We need, hey, uh, all of you need to leave. And he's like, <laughs> got him. Credence is her name. The witch. Credence the witch. Oh, yeah. They, they run into her house. Uh-huh. What is it? A, it's like, it looks like a castle on the inside, but you're right. It, it's what, a house on the outside, probably disguised. And then it's a uh, creepy looking. Her eyes are bulging out of her head and she's got like paint all over her teeth and she's like welcome to my house overacting the the most overacting i've ever seen in my life so in a lot of these films that are critically bad um i always like to give an award uh it's the award to the one person who overacted the shit out of their part and i have to say deborah reed congratulations you get the award this time you gave it a hundred and ten percent you gave it everything you got. You were the best actress in this film, best actor by far, and you overplayed the crap out of that part. Congratulations, Deborah Reed. You were the worst, <laughs> best actor, actress in this movie. It was great. Um, did we, did you mention how Arnold got speared like a dork? Not yet, but we're, we're right at that point. <laughs> he got a spear thrown at him before then. The, this, this crazy witch lady is like, drink drink this dry ice concoction because you know you if you have a bad horror movie you have to put dry ice in something so I there's like that, yeah. steam coming up from the top of it and they both drink it and the girl's like oh oh no i got diarrhea and she like runs up and then she turns into goop <laughs> and this is like this leads into the one of the most classic lines of any movie where arnold looks and he's like i can't move why can't I move in the worst acting possible? And then he looks up and he goes, they're eating her. And then they're going to eat me. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God. We have the exact same note. That's so good. <laughs> that's uh, that's a it. classic scene. And there's like flies all over his face. Yep. Uh, speaking of which, that scene who reminded me of a uh, scary movie when is it john ham who's taking the dump as the priest and I don't remember oh my god so there's a scene in that movie where he's he's playing the priest it's making fun of the exorcist and he's sitting on the toilet and he's and he's like uh, you know pinching one out and he can't he's fighting real hard and like these flies just start like multiplying out of nowhere and are all over him and then he like looks to the sky and says <laughs> Lord, release these demons, and then takes a giant, massive dump. And um, that's, I just, for some reason, had that uh, similarity moment there with all those flies on Arnold's face as he's frozen and can't move. I, that's what I picture. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so after this happens, we flash forward to a dance number from Holly. 
right? She's uh, she's having fun. She's dancing. Whatever. Oh my god, that dancing! Why? I don't because it's the nineties. That's why. Why not? No, like <laughs> it's just so bad. She's just like voguing for a second, and it's just why is she dancing in her bedroom? And then through the window, I don't know how. I have no idea, but the boyfriend shows up. Yep. Here comes and Elliot. He knew where they were, apparently. I don't remember her giving him an address, but... Well... Okay. Yeah, I, okay, so here's where we'll give him it. I, this isn't going to break my suspension of disbelief, right? Uh, okay. Or suspension of belief. So, it's a small town. There isn't many, probably, places for them to go. They were following them pretty closely. Uh, and probably put the RV somewhere else, so that way the parents wouldn't think that they were following them, right? I mean... Oh. Sure. We could why try not? that. We could try that. Sure. Why not? <laughs> we'll say they actually had logic behind what they were doing. Yeah. They doubt, but... Very doubtful, right? <laughs> oh, I, I want to know, like, she's wearing a Garfield shirt. Um, How much money did they pay Jim Davis? Because uh, I don't know if that's legal. Oh, someone's going to get in trouble. Um, is, uh, is that before or after Grandpa comes back and scares the hell out of Holly? Uh... It's while she's doing her dancing. She's wearing the Garfield shirt. So it's before. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, so she was dancing. Then Grandpa comes back. He was trying to get to Joshua, remember? And then yep. showed up in the wrong room or whatever. And what's Grandpa's excuse? Oh, I, I can't quite control these powers, Joshua. I'm, I don't yeah, know the layout of this house. Whatever, you creepy old perv. You were trying to spy on your granddaughter. That's when he, he tells the kid that his dad's good for nothing. Like, way to give confidence in the kid's father, Grandpa. Like, yeah. yeah you know, he, you know that's his dad, right? They don't already have problems. Great job, yeah. Grandpa. Well, you know, it's okay. They only had milk in the fridge in the first place, and it was like cream cheese. So what can you do? <laughs> oh, yeah, when the mom pours it out in the sink. Ugh. That was disgusting. Um... I mean, there's not... Listen, the rest of my notes, it's pretty much just bagging on the movie. Um, no coffee here. It's the devil's drink. Uh, oh, the, yeah, when the, he goes to the grocery store. <laughs> yep, the Nilbog vegetarians. They only eat... Uh, they're vegetarians. They don't have meat. All they that. just got Nilbog milk, and they give it to him for free. Yep. He chugs the whole gallon... <laughs> Now that's hospitality. Oh, man. Hospitality. Um, I think it's not too long after that Joshua realizes Neil Bog backwards is Goblin. Has that moment. Oh, <laughs> shit. Bog Wait, is we... Goblin spelled backwards. We... <laughs> why, why do you sound exactly like the kid? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I am Joshua. Oh, my gosh. This makes so <laughs> much sense. I must do it. I must do it. <laughs> I just for everyone at home, I did not put the clip, the audio bit from the movie. That was actually Clark. That was really good. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> we skipped the cop picking the kid up to take him in. Um, totally normal guy, right? Totally normal yeah. cop. Just picking up a kid. Oh, the green uh, sandwich. Yeah. He's <laughs> yep. He's eating yeah, the green yeah, the sandwich. Green jizz burger. Oh, this is really good. Yeah, after, I bet it is. After Joshua figures out the street sign and realizes it's Goblin backwards. Stumbles into the cult meeting of all the town's folk. Oh, but before that, even like the crazy witch lady breaks into the house and she's like, "Hi, I made you a cake." And this lady's like, "What the hell are you doing in my house?" Oh, I left the mom out of my notes because she is the worst actress in the history of acting. <laughs> the worst. Oh, she's she's if fantastic. You... What are you talking about? She's so great. <laughs> Cut that mom uh, out. If Ugh. you watch the worst movie ever made, I believe she is. Uh, yeah, anyhow, but the the witch kind of enters the house and, like, offers a cake. I don't know what happened, but she's like, hey, would you like this pudding? I'm like, that's a fucking cake. Oh, and then, like, what you're saying, <laughs> like, the kid winds up in this barn, and he's like, oh, I got my skateboard. I got my skateboard with me, and he puts yeah. it on this board he's moving. Like, he doesn't think about moving it, and then it falls through, and, like, the roof is high enough to where I get confused, man. I get confused. Like, did they not think this through? 
because as soon as the skateboard falls, a hand flies through the ceiling and the boy gets pulled down. Yeah, you know, uh, that mo that moment, okay, that part of the movie was definitely weird because you're right, like, he was barely hovering right above uh, the, the preacher's hand, right? Right. I mean, like, there was, I don't know, maybe a couple of inches between this, you know, Joshua's head and his body and the preacher. And I always, I, I kept thinking to myself, like, you're way too close to this guy. Like, if I was a kid that age, hiding above, like, some weird cultic crap going on, no matter how curious I was, I would not allow myself to be that close, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, and the minute that the skateboard moved, bam, the hand goes up, grabs him, pulls him down. Then the dad comes, right? He hears his kid yelling. So the dad comes running in. And then uh, the kid, you know, Joshua tries to explain to his father, you know, they're goblins. Look. Nail bog backwards is goblin uh, and all that. Oh gosh, such a bad movie. Um, where the hell was I at? Notes. <laughs> this is so bad. Oh man. Oh, funny quote. That Playboy son of the Coopers. I think he's talking about Elliot, right? Maybe. I don't know. Holly punches Elliot. She throws a mean right. Look, man, all I know is that Nilbog ice cream does not look like ice cream. <laughs> Elliot's part of the family now, so that's all that really matters. Yeah, because the, the friends are dead, so he's got no friends. He's instantly <laughs> in, right? So, like, he's <laughs> the mom, he's like, oh, what are you doing here? Everybody's like, oh, we hate you. Elliot's part of the family, and the mom, like, grabs his face. Oh, Elliot. Oh, you little rascal. Um, I did love the effects of the growing plants. I thought that that was really cool. They did a really nice job on uh, turning the, the people into plant food. Let's see. Oh, yeah, Drew. What about the beautiful liberated girls? The only guy who can act out of the friends. <laughs> only guy. That was a None really well-delivered line. That was a great line. What about the newly liberated girls? What about the beautiful liberated girls? Um, but yeah, so he goes and he finds Arnold, at least what's left of him, and he tells him, "Don't fret, tree, tree Arnold. <laughs> Don't move fret. me. Don't fret, Arnold. Don't fret, I will Arnold. move you." Um, oh, oh, dude. Michael. dude. So during the house, during the whole tree thing, like, I just. I just don't understand. You just don't. I, the witch shows up and she like stops him from moving him. The kid like, I don't know. He, maybe he turns into goop. I don't remember. But like, she pulls out a chainsaw, and she's like, "He's like, what are you gonna do? Don't worry, this won't hurt. It will only tickle." And then he starts laughing and giggling. Oh yeah, and then she sauces his balls. Does she? Yeah, she goes right from the crotch, I believe. Like. The angle that she's standing, because you don't see it, right? It's kind of off camera. You just see his face now as he starts to giggle. But so from the waist up, he's not being harmed. So you got to think it's only happening from the waist down. And where her arm goes with that thing and starts going up, I'm guessing cross shot instantly. Like she is sawing him from groin to chin. Uh, but yeah, he just starts giggling. He thinks it's funny. Um and she was right. He won't feel any pain. It'll it'll tickle. Tickle the whole way through. Was that them subliminally trying to make people feel better about chopping down trees in the 90s? Um, Probably. Was, I don't was, know. That was a terrible joke. We should, we should cut yeah, that. It wasn't a very good... We, <laughs> we should cut that. Uh, that's going to stay in now. We're going to talk about Brazil now. Um, oh, I found my mom out. note. I found my one mom note. We need to date this. <laughs> stamp it. Time stamp it. Uh, oh, Michael, look what they have prepared for us. Whatever all the townsfolk are at the house, and oh they're throwing like the big barbecue. That's how she delivers the line. Look what they have prepared for us. That cadence, that slow. This is why this woman is a terrible actress. Well, Margot Prey is her name. Look her up. 
She doesn't even get the award because she didn't actually do any acting. You said she was in the worst movie ever? Uh, so everybody is in that movie, everybody from this film. And a lot of them are – I recommend watching that at some point on your own. Spare okay. time. It's kind of like a documentary. So but, is uh, it a uh, best worst movie? Is that what you're talking about? I believe so, yes. Okay, The perfect. best worst movie. All right, uh, added. It's uh, directed by the kid who plays Joshua. Oh, shit. Yeah, there's the dad. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> They're all in it. Uh, so it's actually kind of sad. I, I, oh. I don't want to insult the mom at all. But uh, it's just uh, the point where they're at the house party it just makes no sense. Like a goblin jumps out the mirror and attacks Joshua, and then Grandpa shows up and cuts the goblin's arm off. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, you see the witch show up, and she's like, I have no arm now! Because she was the goblin, bro. She was the goblin. Was she? Yeah. Was she, though? She, she transferred herself with that potion she's mixing threw one mirror on her side, threw his bedroom mirror, psh, comes out. As a goblin. As a goblin, tries to kill him, and then what? Grandpa chops her arm off and sends her back through the mirror dimension, back to her castle. Without Josh was trying to leave at this point, like, after that. Yeah, he's ready to go. He's like, uh-uh, I'm not here. The, the witch is like, all right, I need to, need to touch the uh, this stone from Stonehenge, which is German now. And then, you know, whatever, Grandpa fights a goblin. Goblin's like, goblin's like, I'm gonna cast a spell on you. Brr. And Grandpa's like, Oh no! Ah, uh, Grandpa, you must fight it. You must. You must. And Grandpa's like, You know what? And the, the goblin's like holding this uh, Molotov cocktail that Grandpa apparently brought in. He's like, I hope you can escape this burning building. And he snaps his finger, and the goblin catches fire. The preacher. Or whatever, mm -hmm. and then he, the parents come out. They're like, "Oh, what, what's going on out here? Oh, what's going on out here? More southern hospitality? We're farmers." And he looks at the body, and it's like a guy. And he's like, "What's that?" And the cops like, "You killed one of ours. Now we will kill all of you." And they run back inside. Yeah, and nothing happens. Nope, literally nothing. I my notes are pretty darn uh, empty from here on. We get Lydia, or sorry, we get Lydia from Beetlejuice shows up. Uh, that's what the witch looks like after she puts on all of her sexy makeup. Oh, she, you know what? She's an attractive actress, but after seeing her ham it up, right? As the witch, I just can't find her attractive. That's just, the problem. So like, she's just like hammy, hammily walking around, going trying to act like really sexy, but it just looks completely goofy. Listen, when a sexy witch shows up on your TV, what do you do? And then she shows up at my doorstep, and she's like, I'm not a program. I'm right outside. Like, come on. You know the difference between TV and reality, right? And then I, I just don't understand what the hell Elliot was thinking right there. No, not Elliot. Yeah, Elliot. Wait. Which doofus friend was back at the trailer at that moment? Cause, I don't remember. Because Elliot's but... with Holly, isn't he? Yeah, Elliot's with Holly. It was one of the Three Stooges. So... <sighs> He had three friends. He had three. Arnold, the kid that tried to save Arnold. And Brent. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, Brent. And that's the guy who stayed behind. And he, this girl's like, do you want some corn? He's like, I'd rather have popcorn. She's like, well, we just have to heat it up. And then they both oh start eating the same corn on the cob. And it's like they're trying to, to make love. But then like it's like a bunch of popcorn just gets thrown at them. Yep. It's like, why is she focusing on the kid in the trailer? No, no, it, nothing is happening. Like, still, nothing is happening. Uh, it just didn't make sense. Oh, man. Uh, so to wrap this one up, so there's a fight, breaks out. I got Oh My Joshua, Goblin Balls. Joshua turns into a goblin. Yep. He teleports to the witch's place, and a goblin replaces him. And then, uh, oh, my God. So Joshua, they, they do a seance, which they bring Grandpa back. And Joshua teleports to the witch's place, and he has this satchel, and like the, they're about to take care of him, and he pulls out a double-decker bologna sandwich! <laughs> and the witch and the goblins were like, oh, don't do it! Don't eat it! Think of the, the cholesterol! Think of the, 
the toxins and he just like takes a bite out of it and he throws it at him they're like well we can't touch you now he ate baloney right because the goblins can't eat anything that's eaten real pure food right they can only eat things that have eaten their weird goblin seed crap that's basically even, what grandpa explained in the first five minutes of this film even then they're just like avoiding touching him now because he, he had baloney it, 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 I don't know. It didn't make any sense. So like now One he's drop of is not going to ruin the whole body, right? We can he's massaging the letter hose and rock. Um, as parents come in, they massage the letter hose and rock, and they save the day. And then we're back at their house. Everything seems to be normal. And probably the best part of this movie happens. The end. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, there's, you know what? I have no comments on the ending. Oh, uh, you don't you don't like that? <laughs> I, I have nothing really to say beyond it's just oh, come what on. a waste of time. Come on. So what a, so mom goes upstairs. Uh, yeah, and she eats an apple in their house, and she's like, this apple is so yummy, and the apple, it looks like an apple. Yep, it does. It looks Josh, like a totally I'm going to take a shower. Apple. I'm going to take a nap. Joshua like goes up the stairs, a softball pops down. And it says, your mom is yum. Ye. And then... And it's uh, hard to read. Yeah. My quote, my quote here, do you want some, Joshua? <laughs> All right. Well, that's the end of Troll 2. Um, the moral of the story, eat meat. Eat meat. Uh, don't be a vegetarian. All right. So, <laughs> so God, that movie was freaking terrible. Um, it's got 6% on Rotten Tomatoes on IMDb. Um, it has a 2.9 out of 10. I will give this film two stars out of 10. I could not stand it. Uh, very bad. Great, bad choice, by the way, Clark. I also, I got to give you props on that. Great, bad that film. One, this is not a film you should watch alone. No, um, it's, it's, it would be more of a party watch, right? Yeah, I watched it alone and I just, I, I don't ever want to watch it ever again. Like, I just don't. And I'm sure, like, if somebody's like, hey, let's watch this as a group, I'll be like, ah, sure. And then I'll actually enjoy it. But in this case, I was just, I did not, I didn't, I don't like it. Films that are in the same, like, uh, more like this, right? So things I get, or actually, what's your rating on this out of 10? I give it two dead grandpas out of 90. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh troll the original troll is in here more like this uh best worst movie ever uh birdemic shock and terror uh which is a 1.8 out of 10 samurai cop which by the way we might be watching on this so uh get get excited about that um the room which is a classic uh cult classic with uh, what is it tommy waisu is that how you pronounce the last Wiseau. name yeah why so uh, one of the worst films that everyone actually uh, loves. You have to you have to watch that in theaters. Like that's that's an experience that you have to have at least once in your life. Okay, if the Alamo ever has it, we're going. Just yeah. so you know, make if, sure to bring bring plastic spoons. Okay, all right, and bring then Miami Connection uh, is the other one. It's got Wu Sang Park in it and Y K Kim. <clears throat> uh, so yeah. Terrible film. Terrible film. Don't ever watch Troll 2 by yourself. Uh, don't put yourself through that. But I'm glad now that I can put Best Worst Movie on my list of things to watch. It's got a 7.3 out of 10. Um, I'm excited to watch that without uh, any interruptions. So uh, next podcast will be my pick um, of best and worst acclaimed horror films. Um, the list is growing. I don't know what to pick next. So stay tuned. Uh, please hang out with us and uh yeah till next time keep watching horror films remember <laughs> don't go to no bog don't go to no bog don't go to no bog <laughs> it's spelled it's goblin spelled backwards i'm just gonna tell you this right now in case you didn't know that He's trying! <laughs>